In this video, we're going to take a look at the spreadsheet program Microsoft Excel. Excel is a program used across nearly every industry to help manage data. The program is filled with hundreds of tools that can be used to record, organize, and manipulate data for practically any purpose imaginable. In this video, we're going to see how we can use Excel to perform some basic statistical functions on a set of data. So let's get started. When you first open Excel, you should be looking at a blank spreadsheet like this. The spreadsheet is organized into columns labeled by letters and rows labeled by numbers. Each little rectangle where a column crosses a row is called a cell, and each cell is named by the column and row it belongs in. For instance, this would be cell B4. Knowing the names of the cells becomes important later when we construct mathematical functions within the spreadsheet. The first thing you should do with this spreadsheet is save it with a name and a location. Click File and Save As, then locate your F drive in the computer. Your F drive starts with your own code and ends with F colon in parentheses. Saving in this location ensures that you can access this file from anywhere in the school. You should also change the name from Book 1 to your first name, your last name, and Data Analysis. Once you've performed the Save As, you won't need to do it again, but you should click Save frequently to avoid losing work. Excel files don't save themselves. Starting in cell A1, enter your name. In cell A2, write your class period number, and in cell A3, type the name of this exercise, Data Analysis. Now we're going to need some data to analyze. You should have picked up 27 wooden cubes in the classroom. It would be a good idea to number these cubes, 1 through 27, so you don't lose track of which ones have already been measured. Now use a pair of dial calipers to measure the length of one side of each cube. Starting in cell A5 and working your way down, type the measurement for each cube until you have 27 entries. Just write the number for each measurement. Don't include units as text or punctuation, or Excel won't be able to perform any math with these cells. If you notice that your trailing zeros are being rounded off, you can get them back by selecting the cell and clicking the button Increase Decimal. This will show one additional decimal place. Now we have a nice data set to work with. In the lesson Summary Statistics Part 1, Central Tendency, we talked about a few different methods of communicating the center of a data set, including the mean, median, and mode. It turns out Excel has lots of mathematical functions built into the program. Type mean, median, and mode into cells C5, C6, and C7. Now click on cell D5. This is where we will report the mean value of our data set. In your Home tab, look all the way to the right side of the screen. You should see a button that says Auto Sum, which would add up the values in selected cells. We don't want to add up any values right now, but if you click the drop down arrow next to the Auto Sum, you'll see a handful of other preloaded functions, including one called Average. This is the function we'll use to find our mean, but I want to move past this for now to show you where you can find the rest of the function library. A little further down the menu you should see more functions. Click that option. Now you should be looking at a much larger function library filled with dozens of possible preloaded functions. If you search for the mean, you won't find one. So you'll need to select the average function instead. This will prompt you to select a range of cells which contain the data you want to average. Your 27 data points should be in cells A5 through A31. You can drag a box around these cells to select them, or you can type A5 colon A31 into the field. When you click OK, your mean will be calculated and reported in cell D5 next to the word mean. Your mean should be reported to one decimal place more than the original data, 
so if necessary, use the increase or decrease decimal buttons to show more or less decimal places. Go back to the function menu and repeat the process for the median and for the mode. You can search for the function that you want by name. Realize that when you search for mode, you'll be given multiple options. If you use the mode function and receive an error, it could be because you have multiple modes. You can use the function mode.mult instead, which should report multiple modes if this is the case. Once you have your measures of central tendency reported, let's analyze your data set for variation. Part 2 of the summary statistics lesson covers two different methods for reporting variation in a data set, including range and standard deviation. Leave a space below the mode and type range into C9 and standard deviation into C10. If you search the function library for range, you'll find that a range function doesn't exist. So for this function, you'll have to type the operation into the cell manually. To help, you should use the functions min and max to automatically find the highest and lowest values in your set. Type min into C11 and max into C12. Then use the functions from the library to report these values in cell D11 and D12. If you click back on cell D9, you can construct a custom function to calculate your range. Type an equal sign into the cell. This tells Excel to perform the calculation that follows. After the equal sign, type D12 minus D11. Don't type the value of the measurements that are reported in those cells, but the names of the cells instead. When you use cell names and formulas this way, it doesn't matter what the value in the cell is. If the original data set was updated to include a new minimum or maximum value, the results of min and max would update automatically, and so would your custom-made range function. If you type the measurements instead of the cell names, then the function is static and will not update if changes are made to the data set. In cell D10, insert a standard deviation function for your data. If you search the library for standard deviation, you'll see a few results. The one you're looking for is stdev.p, or population standard deviation. Select this function and enter the range of cells containing your data. You should see the standard deviation reported in cell D10. Be sure to adjust the number of decimal places shown to one more than the original data. Next, let's see how we can create a frequency table and histogram for our data to graph its distribution. Part 3 of the summary statistics lesson talks about distribution and some different ways that it can be shown in graphical form. Before we can create a histogram in Excel, we will need to establish our bins or our class intervals. Take a look at your minimum and maximum values. Based on these, determine a reasonable class interval for your data set that will result in about 10 to 15 class intervals. You might set your class interval to 2, 3, 4, or 5 thousandths of an inch apart. Based on my minimum and maximum values, I'm going to use a class interval of 2 thousandths, starting just below my minimum value. Type these class intervals into one column, starting in cell F3. Next, we'll need to find a histogram feature within Excel. Click File, then Options. Now in the Excel Options window, click Add-ins, and at the bottom, next to Manage, select Excel Add-ins and click Go. Be sure the Analysis Tool Pack option is checked, then click OK. Now you should be able to click the Data tab 
and all the way at the right you should see a new panel called Analysis with a tool called Data Analysis. Click this button and you'll see a new menu of options. Select Histogram from the options and click OK. Now you'll be prompted to enter some cell ranges for your data, your bins, and where you want your frequency table to be placed. Select your data values for your input range and select your bins for your bin range. Leave out any cells containing text. Select cell G3 for your output cell and be sure to check the box Chart Output, then click OK. If all goes well, you should see a frequency table reported right next to your bin list, as well as a histogram showing your collection of data. Change the title of your graph from Histogram to Cube Lengths and drag the chart into the empty area beneath your statistics. Congratulations! Your data analysis is complete. Now let's see how to export your work for submission in Google Classroom. You're going to be submitting your work in the form of a one-page PDF file. Click File and Print, and under the list of available printers, you should see the option to Print to PDF. Select this choice and carefully look over the print preview. It should clearly show all your information neatly organized on one single sheet. If your preview looks correct, click Print. You will then be prompted to save your PDF file. Be sure the save location is in your F drive and that the name of your file is still your first name, last name, data analysis. Save your PDF, then attach this PDF to the statistical data analysis assignment in Google Classroom and submit it. Don't submit your Excel spreadsheet, just your PDF as one single attachment. Now you know a thing or two about working with data in Microsoft Excel. Keep working at it, and this program will be one more tool in your tool belt that you can use for years and years.